This is Tech Talk Today, episode 267. Welcome into Tech Talk Today, episode 267. I'm Chris. And I'm Angela. Hello, Angela. It's a special live edition of the Tech Talk Today program. It's going to be the only live episode this season. These will probably be special events we do from time to time, but I got back from scale this week. I'm just getting caught up on my work. The adventure of the trip at scale and back will continue throughout the rest of season one. But today we're going to be talking news. Yep. Do a special live event. We got the chat room here over at jblive.tv. Oh, and speaking of season one, let us know your thoughts, guys, because uh, we're almost done. Mm hmm. I think there's three episodes left after this. Should the show keep going? What are your expectations for uh, the season two if we do it? Uh, would you like to see us do something else? I'd like to know all your thoughts, especially if you're a patron. Uh, I'll try to start a thread over there at patreon.com slash Jupiter Signal to ask what should we do with the future of Tech Talk today? Now, with all of that said, is there anything else we wanted to mention here at the top? It's been a big week at JB, but we can mention some of that towards the end. After oh, okay. oh, you want to do it? Uh, well, now? no, I don't. No, I was, do it. Do it. Right, I teased well, it. Do it. It's, it's been it's been a huge week for Jupiter Broadcasting. Coda Radio hit 300 episodes, which yeah. is amazing. So if you haven't checked out Coda Radio 300, go to jupiterbroadcasting.com and click on that. Bro, or, or bro. Co uh, okay, coder.show forward slash 300. We got the new site, coder.show. Yes. We actually launched a which whole bunch epic. of, I call them podcast upgrades. A yes. whole bunch of podcast upgrades yeah, for Coder Radio. Yeah, we are slowly converting. Yeah, yeah it's getting but good. The, even just reading the show notes of Coder <laughs> <It's so much laughs> 300 is, now, right? no, well, yes, but oh. no, it's just cool to see like when the first one aired and, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. different different things about it and then yeah. also there's swag right i cool have swag i am on it i have a 300 poster kind of like we did the unfiltered 200 poster where the um it's a word cloud that forms 300 yeah on a poster for coder radio it's like a, containing it, all coder radio titles for yeah. the first 299 episodes so epic looking yep and then there's also coder coasters and those are great literally somebody bought 48 of them they they come in packs of six they're gonna but, deck out their restaurant yeah and then i got um, some right here and then, of course, these are my we, coder coasters. We always have stickers for all the shows. You can go to uh, jupiterbroadcasting.com forward slash stickers. You're forgetting the shirt and hoodie, too. Oh, yeah. I'm so, well, I, I meant teespring.com slash coder 300, is it? Yeah. Okay. Well, that that was totally unplanned. That's what happens when we do a live show. Yep. <laughs> I'm really excited. The 300 episodes is a huge milestone. And uh, you can uh, check it out. The new site, coder.show. And uh, it's going to be multi-track recorded. It's going to be edited. We're going to do local recording for Mike. And we're going to be working on the sound for the next few weeks, trying to make it better and better. Just trying to get all of the shows up a bit. Yep. In a nutshell, we're we're revamping a lot of things right now. And it's, it's all going in an excellent direction of superior quality. Yeah, there is going to be some big changes internally coming to Jupiter Broadcasting. And we're sort of using that as a catalyst to further other change as well. And we'll tell you more about that soon. But before we get into the news, let's take a moment and thank Linux Academy for sponsoring the Tech Talk Today program and especially the special live event, the Tech Talk Live. Go to linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. There, you'll land on a seven-day sign-up page. You get seven days of access for free to the Linux Academy training library. It's a platform to learn everything, everything about Linux, a full-featured training library with everything you need to know to get in-depth on cloud topics that are like OpenStack and Azure and AWS, and then the low-level stuff, like the file system permissions and working with the kernel and the things you need to know to actually make a living on Linux. They have hands-on scenario-based labs that give you experience on real servers and instructors, actual human beings on staff available to help you. They have so much more too, as well as course schedulers to work with your busy week, Nuggets to do deep dives into single topics, downloadable comprehensive study guides offline. Oh, I could go on and on and on. But you just go get a seven-day free trial. LinuxAcademy.com slash unplugged. And a big thank you to Linux Academy for sponsoring the Tech Talk Today program. And uh, thanks for the Unplugged program for letting us steal their URL. <laughs> Suckers. <laughs> LinuxAcademy.com slash unplugged. So you're not going to be mining cryptocurrency via sneaky ads anymore on Google's platform. Google is banning all cryptocurrency and related cryptocurrency ads on their Google ad network starting in June. Wow. So whether or not it's actually behind the scenes mining or, or if it's just legitimate for like Coinbase. 
Wow. Yeah, it's not limited to uh, just like um, exchanges and it's not limited to just like crazy ICO, which are initial coin offering scams or anything like that. It's just cryptocurrencies, trading so, stuff. This is the first step to them entering the cryptocurrency market, right? <laughs> like that's, that's what you do. First totally, you squash right? the competition yeah. while you're getting your crap together. Now and then you get the Google <laughs> yeah. coin out there. Yeah, right. Yeah. Oh, oh, man. Uh, Facebook adopted a similar policy earlier this year when it began prohibiting ads uh, for uh, certain types of ICOs and uh, cryptocurrencies. But they haven't, their ban is not as extensive, though, as Google's is going to be. This is an interesting move by the Googs, and I can kind of understand why, because it would seem like it's almost too much effort to weed out the legitimate um, cryptocurrency ads from the ones that could be just selling a scam. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll see where that goes. Well, I'll, I'll see where I wonder if Google will retract that as cryptocurrency becomes more mainstream. Mm hmm. We will, we will see. Now, YouTube, part of Google, um, didn't inform Wikipedia about its plans to embed Wikipedia in YouTube. So if you didn't know, the YouTube CEO announced at South by Southwest that YouTube is going to start adding information from Wikipedia articles to conspiracy-related videos within the next few weeks. Wow. Now, I don't know what that means exactly what defines a conspiracy related video i mean you can sure you can say some obvious examples yeah. like alex jones but uh you gotta wonder well that's interesting because Where wikipedia is is uh consumer contributed yeah. right is that i think there's a better way to say that but user um, user contributed it's user not edited. necessarily factual or accurate you know, know. Yeah, yeah. so to well, put it on a <laughs> so Wikimedia, the, the the business behind uh, Wikipedia, w pointed out a few things that essentially spell out a a heads up would have been nice Google. B now we're worried this is going to lead to way more vandalism. C which right. will lead to way more user work. Uh, just because it's on YouTube. So here's what they say. According to Wikimedia, Wikimedia, the partnership isn't a formal one with either Wikimedia or Wikipedia. They go on to say that. Uh, while YouTube doesn't necessarily need to officially a partner with M Wikimedia because the Wikipedia articles are licensed for anyone to use, but they go on to say, gosh, this is going to cause some work and we want people all over the world to be able to use, share, and add and remix Wikipedia. But at the same time, we encourage companies who use Wikimedia's content to give back in the spirit of sustainability. In other words, give us a donation or get some people on here editing. If you're going to start embedding these YouTube... You know... If if some major thing came up and said, by the way, we're going to feature your, <laughs> I'm not sure I'd complain. Like, yes, you, there are some back end things to and things to iron out or work out, but this is a, an amazing opportunity that just fell in their lap. Yeah, it is in a sense, but it also is going to lead to way more traffic on those articles. Uh huh. And you know, they're probably worried. I mean, look at the YouTube comment section. What if they start flooding into Wikipedia and start vandalizing these these posts? Yeah. Hmm. Wow. Um, uh, they so uh, yeah. I mean, people are saying, "Hey, well, isn't going to link this increase traffic?" Yeah, it will. Will it increase vandalism? It's possible. It seems like the polite thing to do would have been at least inform Wikimedia that this was coming, mm -hmm. because they don't have infinite labor. So there yeah. is some sort of impact there. Uh, I oh man. So yeah, if you've heard about YouTube embedding Wikipedia articles on conspiracy videos. Well, and I, only on conspiracy videos, yeah. right? They're, and somebody has to be labeling them as a conspiracy, right? Somebody has wow. to be making that determination. Mm -hmm. Or a bot is, which is even scarier. <laughs> Flag as conspiracy. <laughs> now, I want to talk about uh, Meltdown and Spectre. Who, what? Now, we haven't ever talked about them on the show before, so here's a little primer if you're not familiar with them. There are three variants of the security vulnerabilities known collectively as Spectre, and Meltdown. Variant 1 and 2 are different aspects of Spectre, while Variant 3 is Meltdown. Fixes for Variant 1, 2, and 3 have already been released, and the best way to stay protected is to keep your system up to date. But what are Spectre and Meltdown, and how do these fixes work? Let's address that by focusing in on Variant 2, which exploits a valuable computer feature called Speculative Execution. Speculative execution enhances a CPU's speed and performance with a feature that allows it to speculate on what tasks might lie ahead, even before the CPU actually makes that request. The speculative execution feature serves as a kind of scout, operating well out in front of the CPU's many other functions and capabilities. 
Its goal is to speed things up for the entire system by exploring lots of potential CPU tasks in advance. So this speculative execution feature was a, sort of a hotshot feature that um, sort of had some assumptions made around its security. Now, as promised, Intel has announced that the 8th generation Xeon and Core processors are going to, quote, further reduce the risk of attack of Spectre and Meltdown via hardware fixes. They will work in combination with the software, which they say this should be close to 100% fix. The hardware changes will stop attacks by Spectre Variant 2 and Meltdown Variant 3 weaknesses, and that's it. But the software fixes will still be required to have them on, you'll still have to have this, all the software patches and microcode fixes to, to fend off against Spectre Variant 1. It gets confusing because there's multiple variants uh, and there's different ways to protect yourself, but nonetheless, it, by the 8th Gen Xeon chips, with the right amount of software and these new 8th gen Xeons or cores, this should be pretty much there. Now, Intel's being a little bit dicey on like the commitment to this because they also have something coming down the road that'll be in a new generation of processors called partitioning. And this is gonna be what I think Intel's gonna position as the final fix. And you can think of it as additional protective walls between applications and user privileges. And uh, that's gonna start with uh, the, um, the fir first round of changes starts with Cascade Lake, and then the final partitioning will be in the generation after that. Is your head spinning? Yeah, I'm just, I'm, yep. You're yeah. doing a great job. Yeah, right. <laughs> the reason I wanted to mention this is because there's been a lot of um, debate on when is Intel actually going to ship a hardware fix? Because they've been trying to solve this in software, but the core yeah. issue is in the hardware design. They're positioning this as a fix, but when you actually dig into their language, it doesn't sound like it's the final fix. So that's why I wanted to cover the story, because I want everybody to be a little spe uh, spectacle, skeptical. And I'll have a link in the show notes. Go to techtalk.today slash 267 to get that information. Now, let's shift gears and talk about a couple of subscription services that uh, one that's going to be arriving soon and one that's blowing up. The first that's arriving soon is Lyft is testing a Netflix style monthly subscription plan. You know the Uber competitor? Mm -hmm. 30 rides for one ninety nine a month. 199 Yep. Interesting. 30 rides. Up to uh, 30 rides, yes. right? As yep. So it's, they're actually testing several pricing. So the monthly subscription plans are for high-frequency users. Uh-huh. And... Probably the, one ride per day, at least, or at least yeah. during the week. Well, usually... So I think they're selecting... What it says here in the articles, they're selecting people that were spending around $450 uh -huh. a month. Yes. So the all-access plans offered 30 standard lift rides for $199 a month. And then there was another package they were offering at $300 a month, which had like 60 rides. So, you know, they're different prices pricing plans. And the Lyft CEO mentioned that these subscription plans were the future of the company during a press event this Wednesday. So is a ride considered, you know, like from the studio to my house, that's one? Um, or is it back? It's it's a ride that does not exceed $15. I, oh, yeah. ouch. And which, so then overages fees apply. Yeah, you know? which is not clear what happens. When ah, geez. You know, now, this feels like data plans. You yeah, know? it does, doesn't it? It's, well, it's a subscription plan, right? Yeah. But the, so when you live in a dense city, well, when, I, when I was bopping around uh, San Francisco, or if you're bopping around Seattle or New York, these drives are usually like six bucks mm -hmm. because um, it's just a, usually a quick hop and it's cheaper than even pay parking. So yeah. I could kind of see like, if you lived downtown, you didn't have a vehicle, you're spending around $400 a month. Mm -hmm. I actually might be into this, mm -hmm. but the $15 thing would never work here up in, in, in Northern Washington because our, our, our short drives are 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, <laughs> easily. Now here is the subscription service that is blowing up. Uh, they had a really big sale going a couple of weeks ago, so it came across my radar. And I was tempted, even though I don't go to the movies very much. It's called Movie Pass. Have you heard of yes, it? Yes, I have. I was actually going to mention it with yeah. the last... Uh, so they have, uh, they will have 5 million subscribers by the end of 2018. And mm -hmm. the whole the whole deal with Movie Pass is a movie a day. For, uh, one move, You can go to one movie a day if with, you want. With limitations. Yes. Right. Yeah. New releases, I'm sure, are off limits. I don't know. I'm pretty sure uh, they are. Like so, opening yeah. weekend, at least. So they're already accounting for 20% of all movie ticket purchases in the States. They use a MasterCard, like a like a, uh, like a pre-charged MasterCard, which you can use in other locations, and they will crack down on you so fast. They'll, they will turn <laughs> it. They hate that. They just wow. hate that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but here's how they're really going to make money. The CEO, Mitch Lowe, uh, was recently bragging about how data 
is the untapped gold mine. Or he said, actually, his exact quote was, data is the new oil. How will MoviePass monetize it? His yes. answer to that question was, our vision is to build a night out at the movies. You know, what he means is a profile of your night out at the movies, including by guiding users to meals before and after seeing a film. He said it was possible because they have, quote, enormous amounts of information. They mail you the card so they know your home address. We know the makeup of your household, the kids, the age groups, the income. It's all based on where you live. And it's not that we ask that. It's just that we have the ability to figure that out. Then he continues, because we're being tracked, you know, with the GPS in your phone. So we've got that. We watch how you drive from when you go home from the movies. We watch kind of what you do afterwards and, you know, what movies you watch. We know all about you. We don't sell that data. What we do is we use that data to market a film. Or, well, or as you said, or figure out what you should eat before. Yeah, he or after. says we could. That's what he says like, they could do. That's yeah, that's weird. He, and you could see him. You could see them positioning themselves, selling them to Hollywood. Like this is the way you're going to get people into your movies. Is we know we know what kind of tacos they like. We know how many <laughs> kids they have. We know how fast they drive after they go watch an action flick. So wow, market to them. Wow. Yeah. That is creepy. That's very Big Brother, and he's he's excited about it. <laughs> I know. And you know they were offering when they were offering a uh, special for nine ninety nine, nine ninety nine a, a month. month. Yeah, for a movie a day. Yeah, I was like, if that even just paid for my ticket, and then I bought like the kids' tickets or yep. something, that's still a good deal. Yes. And they're also exploring rolling out families for yeah. so you can get three tickets and stuff. Right. They would have to because yeah. And I'm like, how can they afford to do it at nine ninety nine? Well, that's how. Because yeah. they're really going to monetize the data. Oh, man. I, I tell you what, that is just so creepy. So let's talk about something that made me really, really happy this morning. You wouldn't think such a simple thing would be the highlight of my day, but so far, Amazon is testing a new brief mode for Echoes that replaces verbal prompts with simple, short, pleasant beeps. Now, I know this sounds weird, especially if you don't have a lady tube. Uh, and it's just being beta tested in a few places. Thankfully, I happen to be one of the people that gets these th this morning. So I'll give you a scenario. We're, we're, uh, we, we used the lady tube t uh, last night when we went to bed to set an alarm for 5.30 a.m., right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it wakes us up with a nice pleasant jingle at 5.30 a.m. Uh, oh, actually, no, that was the morning before. This morning, before the alarm goes off, Hadia says, she, now we're both awake because we just had kind of woken up and say, I, I could actually use for a little more sleep. Do you mind if I move the alarm? Mm -hmm. I'm, no, go ahead. So then she says, hey, lady tube, move the alarm to 630. And then the lady tube says, okay, I have moved your 530 a.m. alarm to 630 a.m. Like it's super loud. And like, yeah. Or like you, when you say, hey, lady tube, turn on the heat. Okay. And then, like, you know, it's like, oh, I just <laughs> yeah. want the heater on. Yeah. So just now, warm. in brief mode, you'll say, hey, lady tube, turn the heater on. It goes, doo -doo. Ah. and you say, move the alarm. It goes, doo -doo. and that's it. That's it. Okay. And you could see how they could really kind of expand on that, too. Like, uh, what I've been waiting for is these lady tubes to figure out it's nighttime. So at nighttime, respond with lower volume. Yes. You know, do a D&D well, yeah. mode automatically. We have the, like, the... Uh, uh, what the thing on the phone. The D&D mode on the phone. No, the, the light thing on monitors. Oh, yeah. You know? Sure, of course. Night shift. Night shift. Well, and they know, you know, it knows what time it is and all of that. So you could see how it could probably expand... Um, and I would like to see all of the virtual assistants take this on because you don't need it. After you've had it for a week, you yeah. don't need all these verbal responses. Yeah, the, the full on repeat. You got it. You got it. You know? Yeah. Now let's talk about Geek Squad. Uh, this story came across my radar. Uh, the EFF published this on March 6th, th March 6th. And on March 6th, they wrote uh, a post about how the FBI is working with Geek Squad. And it's it's about as gross as you would expect. And it also, you can tell it started with good intentions because any, I've, I've, I have seen, you know, nudie pictures on a computer I'm working on before. It just happens. Somebody gives you their computer and you're working on it and you would, for whatever reason, just, you know, in years and years, it, it happened to me once. So every now and then you're working on somebody's computer and you see stuff on there. Well, you got to figure every now and then there's going to be like child porn on there. Right. right. And so Geek Squad had that, had that happen and they had to figure out, well, what do we do about this? So right. they developed, a relationship with the FBI. But then, of course, it expands from there. And the FBI starts wooing them with special trips and treats. They start putting on presentations for the FBI. Yep. The FBI starts giving them surveillance tools. They start proactively looking for things for the FBI without a warrant. And the uh. EFF lays it all out right here. They have a, file law they have a FOIA lawsuit right now, Freedom of Information Request, 
Act uh, to try to learn more about how the FBI was using Geek Squad employees to flag illegal material. But so far, they figured out it included things like $500 payments to Geek Squad employees. Other documents show over the years, working with Geek Squad employees, the FBI's agents developed a process for prosecuting people who sent, who sent their devices to Geek Squad. The documents would detail a series of FBI investigations in which the Geek Squad employee would call the FBI's office after finding what they believed was child pornography. Some of these reports indicate that the FBI treated the Geek Squad employees as informants, identifying them as simply, quote, CHS, which is shorthand for confidential human source. Hmm. And then they would sometimes, uh, the EFF likely believes, that the FBI would have them essentially start the process before anybody had been authorized to do the process. But because they were the person had handed their computer over to Best Buy, there was probably some agreement there that they had, they had the right to go through the machine or something. So anyways, uh, it's gross and it's as bad as you might suspect it is. And I'll have a link in the show notes. And this one, this is one of the things that the Electronic Frontier Foundation does that I really appreciate. And uh, a Best Buy spokesperson has confirmed the reports, by the way. So it's wow. confirmed by a Best Buy spokes spokesperson that this happens. <sighs> Geek Squad. Yeah. Geek Squad. You want to uh, you want to talk about space for a little bit? Yeah. I thought maybe we could do a space corner in the show. Totally. I didn't come up with like a space corner jingle or anything, but I thought it'd be fun to talk about some space news. And there has been a space story that has been so mangled by the media. It's about Scott Kelly, you know, the astronaut that was up in space and he oh, has a twin brother yes. down here. Yeah. Well, the reports are that 7% of Scott Kelly's DNA has been altered. NASA says spending a year in space actually made astronaut Scott Kelly into a new man as he returned with different DNA. We already knew that Kelly grew two inches while in space. NASA announced that shortly after he touched back down. But now, they have compared his DNA to that of his identical twin brother, Mark, and found a 7% difference. And unlike the height, NASA says that DNA might not ever return to the way it was, saying, quote, Scott's telomeres, in caps of chromosomes that shorten as one ages, actually became significantly longer in space. They added that Kelly had hundreds of space genes activated by his time in orbit, which altered his immune system, DNA repair, bone formation networks, and more. The only problem with this story is that it's not true. It's not. It's not true. Uh, in fact, the Scott Kelly himself even mocked the story on Twitter. So a NASA spokesperson has sorted out what's going on, and what. It, and this is. I've seen this on NBC News. I have seen this everywhere. It's just the, the media really falls down when covering science stuff. So the NASA spokesperson writes that Scott's DNA did not fundamentally change. What researchers did observe are changes in gene expression, which is how your body reacts to your environment. And NASA believes it is likely within the range for humans under stress, such as, and I quote, mountain climbing or scuba diving. Yeah, no, actually, uh, you know, I did the 23andMe test and um, I have a certain, well, I have actually a lot of gene mutations. And one of them in particular that I was worried about actually doesn't appear to be expressing. So um, even though I have the mutation, it's not currently, you know, a problem for me. So I totally understand mm. where this is coming from, but it is weird that they're reporting it as, you know, a change in DNA because it, yeah, it's it, not a change in DNA. It's, right. And yeah. it shows you it shows you um, how little our understanding is because not only is there the genes and if they're activated, but then it's how they're expressed too. Yes. Oh wow, that's complicated. Uh, so yeah, it's well, and stress can cause you know them to turn off or on, and yeah, there's so many. It's just factors. too nuanced for the media to cover correctly. And yes. You're just still <laughs> seeing you're still seeing seven percent of his genes are changed. In well, fact, I think I will talk to my naturopath next time I see her and ask her her thoughts on it. Yeah, because it would be really interesting. Well, and I've also heard that we share ninety-seven percent of our DNA with 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 chimps or something or whatever it is. So, like, how if seven percent of his DNA has changed, that math doesn't work just right <laughs> yeah, there. Right, you know what right, I'm saying? Right. So mysteries are around us all the time, including the mystery of Steve. He's part of the Northern Lights, you know, the Aurora Borealis. They're caused by glowing atoms in the upper atmosphere, electrified by cosmic rays. Steve is something quite different. There's a very, very intense, narrow stream of westward flowing ionized or charged gas. And it's flowing westward at maybe 300 or 400 kilometers in altitude. And it's flowing westward at about six or seven kilometers per second. And it's, it's also very hot, about 6,000 degrees Celsius. 
Yeah, and uh, it was discovered by enthusiast photographers who would jack up the image settings on their camera, and they started noticing these strange purple streaks. And that's where Steve's name comes from, is it was from the community, and it just sort of stuck. Many had noticed a faint glowing streak in the sky before, but they used enhanced photographic techniques to actually see Steve. Then Swarm got involved. That's a European space agency project using three satellites that orbit through and measure the Earth's magnetic field. So that's the science of Steve, but the unusual name, chosen by the unscientifically trained Aurora chasers, stuck. Steve is still just Steve. The community that we have is absolutely energized by the fact that they've been able to make contributions, real contributions to an actual scientific uh, research and, and bit of a breakthrough in this phenomena. The Northern Lights is on my bucket list. I really want to see this. And they have some great photos in the article I've linked in the show notes up from BC. You know, we I can have, really see Steve. <laughs> I have been, yeah, I have been actually looking up Aurora Borealis oh, yeah? pictures to paint on rocks. Oh, yeah. 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 I'm totally going to paint Steve. <laughs> totally. Yeah. It's purple, which is a good color. All right, Andrews, are you ready to kick it? It's our Kickstarter of the week, and I'm doing something we've never... I picked this one myself. Usually you pick them. But I just saw this, and I was like, I'm going to save this for the show. It's called Deadwood 1876. It's a safe robbing game of teamwork and betrayal. I love the idea. They're trying to raise $25,000. They smashed that. They've raised $354,000, and they still have six days to go. So you can still get in on this fun-sounding game. I was a young man in 76 when gold was discovered in the little town of Deadwood, South Dakota. I arrived with the cowboys, gamblers, businessmen, and uh, entertainers all looking to find or steal their share of the gold. Establishments popped up all over town and gunfights broke out in the streets daily. Sometimes you could find a friend to lend you a hand. Sometimes you lost everything. People started teaming up, trusting each other, working together to find and share the gold. But greed gets the best of everyone in Deadwood, and it seems that everyone had a secret to keep. I alone was loyal to my friends. That is, until we had collected all the gold. In the final showdown, my hidden gun threw too much for them. The gold was all mine. But my friend. What I love about it is you team up and you work with your friends, but somebody has to win in the end. And so you end up having to basically kill your friends. Um, and they have pretty reasonable prices to get in. You know, it starts really at 23 bucks and then goes up there for the fancier that you want to get. And uh, if you want to get like a really, the really nice looking book and all of that. So this is a pretty fun Kickstarter. Okay. So I just have a couple questions. One, is it based on the show Deadwood? No, but it's based on the town Deadwood, which the show's based okay. on. Yeah. Oh, okay. Interesting. And is it a board game? Yeah, it's a card game, token a game, card, board okay, game. Okay. Uh, it comes with a set of dice that are really super cool for rolling. And you've got like badges and it's got a leather satchel for that. <laughs> and then, yeah, there's the set of, uh, I think there's called safe cards because you're busting into safes and stuff. Yeah. And you get you get a 20 set and they, they say they've attempted to make them look like they're genuine uh, cards from, you know, like the, the old days. Like they're uh -huh. trying to make them look legitimate. They have a nice looking legitimate case for them. That's a, I keep saying the word, but uh, legitimate. But what I mean by it is, Authentic. That's what I'm trying to say. Yes. It's like authentic looking. And uh, it, it's, I'm pretty impressed. And the price isn't bad. I don't think we've ever done a game. Yeah, so no, that's cool. I'm going to give this one a plug. It's by Travis Hancock. It's on Kickstarter. And we'll have a link in the show notes because it's a pretty large one. I'll just go search for Deadwood 1876 for our Kickstarter of the week. Now, Andrews, before we get out of here, uh, I'm going to give a quick uh, mention that uh, we have the, we have the, not only do we have the coder.show, but now we also have techtalk.systems and techtalk.today. We've been launching a whole bunch of different sites. And so if it's starting to get hard to keep track of, don't worry, we may have changes down the road coming to the Jupiter Broadcasting site. We're still working that out to kind of link everything together for you. But everything we cover is still all centrally posted over jupiterbroadcasting.com. I know it's a lot to keep track of these days, but we're on top of it. What else should we mention before we get out of here? 
Uh, you can contact either of us on Twitter. I'm at Angers. Yeah, I'm at Chris L.E.S. You can send in your notes like what you think we should do with uh, season two. Do we keep the show going? Should we try something else? Let us know. Tech talk dot today slash contact. And then uh, next week, I'll resume my trip back from scale. There was some good. I got a good, good really good conversations. There's so I have hundred and uh, I have one hundred and forty three different clips of interviews and chats with people to go through wow. on top of our trip and all of that. Now, don't worry, I'm not playing all that in the show. I'm going to pick like my favorite three or four and put it together. And uh, that's how we're going to finish out season one, as well as uh, as long as we can make it work, you'll be returning for the new segment on the show is for the rest of the season. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to aim for two a week. We took some we took some downtime when I got back because we were also dealing with uh, a licensing issue for the music. The company that we licensed the music from had my vlog registered, but not the JB channel. And so uh -huh. I got all that sorted out. So we're not getting flagged as copyright violators anymore and all that kind of stuff. So the show should be back in full swing, assuming um, everything is goes as planned next week. So go to techtalk.today slash subscribe to get all of the ways to get this show automatically when we release new episodes. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Tech Talk Today, and we'll see you next week. Later. <laughs>